Hi, Moms Making Six Figures. Today, I am here with Jessica Smith, who you are going to take some great tax nuggets from. <laughs> um, I actually interviewed Jessica a few years ago, and the progression in her business, I just thought, warranted me having her back. So you could hear some of the nuggets of scaling a business for those of you that are intrigued with that. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Moms Making Six Figures podcast. My name is Heidi Bartolotta. I'm your host. In this podcast, you will hear real women, real stories, and real inspiration. If you enjoy it, please subscribe. Hi. How are you doing? Good. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. Yeah, welcome back. This is going to be fun. Yes. So the last time I had you here, you were relatively new into your business. Mm -hmm. Now you've had, you have quite a bit of time and a lot of clients under your belt. Yes. The growth that I experienced probably from the last time you and I met to now is, has been phenomenal. Yeah. So talk about that. We obviously, you know, the demographic, a lot of people aspiring to six figures, mm -hmm a lot that are in that category, but like to listen to kind of their peer group. So talk about that growth because you were already very successful, but the growth has been a little bit crazy. A little bit. Uh, so when I first started my business, you know, it was out of necessity. I had a really bad breakup with a former employer, COVID hit, I was about to have a baby and it was kind of do or die, right? Like mm -hmm. what's gonna happen? And having the opportunity to immerse myself in the business helped me identify a ton of different things that I can do to improve my service level, to improve um, the clients that I work with, the people that I select who I want to work with, um, and also just really growing a community. And probably the craziest part about what has changed since the last time you and I met, it was a happy accident, but I was leaning into systems. Mm -hmm. My line of work has a lot of manual work that needs to be done. And it's very, very hard as a solopreneur to remember to email people, remember to remind them of, hey, I, I follow up, I need this from you. And a lot of that manual work is very, very burdensome. Mm -hmm. And I researched the system and it promised it could do all these things. And so I spent probably a hundred hours, like three weeks, and I went through just a ton of different steps to make this work for me. And luck have it, I had some other colleagues who were looking for a similar solution. It got posted into the community group for that provider. And then the next thing I know, I was hosting a paid webinar and I had 115 people pay for that webinar, which was an amazing, amazing thing. I never imagined that anyone would even show up. And then within a year, um, I had worked, I worked now with a par business partner and we've grown our tax community Facebook group from zero to over 4,500 within a year. And we help tax professionals automate their practices and avoid the just redundant admin work. Mm -hmm. So that's been a really crazy journey. I have people who recognize me now. Mm -hmm. I don't, I never realized that that was a thing. People would say, oh, you're Jessica, I'm in your group. It's so nice to meet you. Um, so that's been an amazing change going into a side of the business that was maybe not what I expected. Mm -hmm. And then of course, leaning into that system, it helped me like in improve the customer experience. So no longer was I having to con be concerned with clients who were saying, hey, what's the status of this? Or, you know, can I make an appointment with you? I, I'm now able to work a lot more efficiently. People are getting status updates a lot quicker um, and it doesn't feel so overwhelming anymore. So that's been a, very positive change from the last time that you and I connected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Systems are huge. And overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and especially you in your line of work, because there's so much that goes into it. I can't even imagine. It's very, uh, the system that I use is very customizable. Mm -hmm. And with anything that is that robust, it it's, there's a huge learning curve. Oh, yeah. And um one of the things that my business partner, Jamie, and I decided is that we wanted to be, when you talk about this platform, we wanted to be the people that you think about to teach you how to do this. That's I'm cool. a real accountant. She's a <laughs> systems expert. And, you know, we're we're collaborating together and using real life experience 
to provide solutions for how to use this platform. Mm -hmm. And we actually launched a, um, a membership. And um, surprisingly enough, within our first launch, we made over six figures easily. We've now relaunched twice, and um, we're on track to probably hit seven figures this year. That's awesome. Yeah. It's crazy. And how has that played out in motherhood? So <laughs> it's funny we're. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, I think the craziest part is, again, trying to find ways to alleviate the amount of hours that I was spending mm -hmm. in my job really is what drew me to systems in the first place. And I do work with a lot of other parents, lots of moms who are in this business, mm -hmm. who are trying to find the same, you know, the work-life balance we all talk about. Right. And even though I don't feel that that's entirely achievable, I at least felt comfortable taking one day off a week, not working 40 hours, working 30. Mm -hmm. And being able to do so without putting strain on expectations that my clients wanted me to meet, keeping them informed, it was just a... It was just a great, great opportunity to share that with other people with this membership as well. So it's just kind of crazy. It's interesting where business takes you and where life takes you. Really. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially if you're just open to it, which is such an interesting thing, I think, especially for people that are listening, because there are so many that I think get almost too focused on this is what has to happen mm -hmm. and they keep banging their head against the wall here. And it's like, oh, but maybe I need to like shift a little bit or yes. be open to that. So I think it's a great reminder of that. Yeah. So and we have a lot of listeners, obviously. Give me some tips. You know, tax. I mean, taxes. Yeah. Tax is that word that I think probably scares most people. It does. <laughs> yeah, um, because it's so confusing. I do joke that taxes is not a dirty word um, <laughs> because I, I do meet a lot of people who actually come from me from a source of concern. Um, you know, we all joke that the IRS wants you to report your income well, how do I do that? Well, you got to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we know how much you owe. Well, are you going to tell me? No. Well, what if I get it wrong? And then, well, I'm going to go to jail, right? That's that's the joke. And or are um, you going to have the huge right, penalty? Exactly. Or you're like, ah. And there, there's just a lot of misunderstanding about the industry itself. And I think from a position of what I would say are my top three tips, you know, you can really reduce your tax burden with some very simple strategies. I have to say the retirement planning is probably the most under underdeserved tax strategy. It's it's a great tax it's a great savings vehicle and by making a contribution to a plan that will benefit you down the line, you're mm -hmm. shielding your money not only from the taxes but you're also investing in yourself down the line. Yeah. But invest your retirement plan. Mm -hmm. Too many people just contribute and then it just sits there. Mm. If you are participating in like a 401k, you can only put away $19,000 a year. How are you going to make millions to support your lifestyle when you're ready to retire off only putting in that much per year? So investing is super important. Um, I think another really like tax strategy that kind of flies under the radar is the health savings account or the HSA. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us talk about needing health insurance, wanting health insurance to avoid the possibility of a catastrophic event. And for many people, if you're if you're healthy and you don't visit the doctor very often, uh, investing in a high deductible plan, which is what is required for the HSA, is a great, great savings vehicle. Um, you get a lower monthly premium, and then you invest into the HSA, and you can then pay your medical expenses tax-free. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a great, uh, great savings vehicle in that regard. But the other benefit is you can invest the HSA like a retirement plan. So you can have a formal retirement plan and an HSA. So you have different streams of retirement income as you get older. Mm -hmm. um, and I think probably, of course, my favorite one is work with a tax professional, but really work with someone who is familiar with your industry. A lot more people are working online, which has its own set of complexities. Mm -hmm. We're working in many different states. And if you are working with someone who only understands their local state rules and regulations, and you are working in a state that they're not familiar with, it could cause an issue with them properly supporting you. So always find someone who understands, you know, your business. Mm -hmm. And I know 4,500 tax professionals if anybody needs a referral. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're a new book, podcast, anything you would recommend outside of tax? <sighs> outside of taxes. Do you, do you even read anything? I really, I really don't because I <laughs> a lot of my reading, and this is so silly, a lot of my reading is 
on staying up to date with tax law changes. Yeah. And I know that doesn't sound exciting to people, but it's exciting to me because if I learn something new, it's benefiting my clients. And I know that a lot of people probably like don't like taxes. I don't like taxes either, but I like helping people. And that's really what drove me to this industry. Um, I do, I do have um, a, a TV show that I guess I've gotten into lately. So, and I don't watch a ton of TV, but I do like, um, it's Chicago Med. It's like an older, uh, like a Grey's Anatomy knockoff. Okay. <laughs> and I think I like it so much because like the Grey's Anatomy drama is really over the top, but those actors are really good. These actors are not that great. And um, the the drama in that show, like it's it's just really over the top. And it's just so funny because you can predict what they're going to say. Code blue, code blue, like on every episode. And it's always the same people, you know, but yeah, very dramatic, but not like the best acting. So there's a little bit of humor, humor in that, but it's an older show. Okay. How about, how about funny mom moment? Cause you've got, you're in a totally <laughs> different phase of parenting than yes. I am. So, uh, so, I mean, I, I've got a very kind of widespread, I've got my 15 year old son, mm -hmm. five-year-old daughter and a two-year-old daughter. So I have, you know, a big age gap between the kiddos. Um, I mean, I have tons of, of stories that I could share, but I think my favorite has been, um, some of the Facebook memories that pop up and, you know, I'm potty training my two-year-old and I've got Facebook memories of, of your five my five-year-old when we were potty training. And one that came up was, was kind of funny. Um, and this one is, is less gross, but my, my daughter had gone to the bathroom and I was so happy. So, you know, you praise her. And then she turns around and like, puts her hand in the toilet and starts splashing. So obviously I am I I turn from excitement and, ha and happiness to, like, oh my Lord, so you, 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 you grab them really quick and you try to wash your hands. And they're like, what are you doing? Um, and that was, that just popped up the other day on my memories. So it was, it was really funny. And yes, the baby also um, thinks that the toilet is a toy. Mm -hmm. um, so locks on everything. But that would probably be um, some of the more, funny stuff that has happened more recently. Okay, so why don't we wrap up with scaling? Because I think, obviously, there's a lot of people that are listening that are scaling a mm -hmm. business. Any wonderful tip, anything other than systems? Because obviously systems has been the primary thing yes. that you've talked about. But for someone that has a small business that is really wanting to accelerate their growth, is there anything that you would say was very helpful for you? I love working with mentors. I'm not a big like high ticket business coach person, because I think there are lots of business coaches out there that don't know what they're doing, that are promising really crazy results. And they're promising that on the premise that you do exactly what they do and you're gonna achieve the same level of success as they supposedly did. So I believe in mentorship mm -hmm. versus coaching. I do work with a few select business coaches that have been beneficial to me. Um, but I would say another thing to scale is don't ignore your taxes as your income is coming in. Because it's very scary that first time that you earn your first six figures and you owe $30,000 that you didn't expect and you made no payments in. Mm -hmm. And if you are regularly used to receiving a refund and you owe money, it hurts. Mm -hmm. it hurts really bad. So I, I always suggest that people just pay or at least plan to pay 20% of all their gross income for taxes. And you can pay monthly. There's no rule that it has to be quarterly but you can make a monthly payment and then you're getting ahead of having this massive balance that you cannot pay, which comes with penalties and interest. So mm -hmm. if you want to really save your money, pay into the tax system and really make sure that you're being mindful of, of that growth and what that does to your tax liability. So I'm gonna ask you to define something because I think mm -hmm. it's really interesting that you said this. So mentorship versus coaching, because mm -hmm. this is something that I'm hugely passionate about. I think you know that. So define the difference in your eyes. So I would say, um, I, I could probably compare this to how people view interns. So interns, when you hire an intern, the rule for it to be an unpaid internship is that person cannot replace a regularly paid employee. And it also has to be to the benefit of the intern to the detriment almost of the business. Um, so you can't, again, just have someone who has no oversight or training for their position, but they're just free labor. So in a similar way, coaching and mentorship are kind of viewed similarly. A mentor, almost to their inconvenience, is there to grow you and really 
teach you the ropes of the industry, sometimes with payment and sometimes not. I do some very kind of off the fly mentorship. People will reach out to me, we'll give them 15 minutes of time, go over their scenario. Mm -hmm. And I don't ask for anything in return, but they always buy me a little gift off my Amazon wish list. So it's, um, it's, it's rewarding without having to say, oh, I'm gonna charge you for my time. Mm-hmm. Um, the sad thing is coaching has become kind of like the new thing where it's honestly a money grab. Many people are underqualified or you know, they say, buy into my program, it's $25,000 and you'll, you're guaranteed to make you know, seven figures. And it's just, that's just not the reality for a lot of people. Um, and I find that a mentor, again, will likely to maybe an inconvenience for them or maybe they aren't compensated to what they would normally get. Mm-hmm. That person is invested in your success. Mm-hmm. The business coach sometimes is only invested in the in the fee you're going to pay him. Yeah. It's an interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I do agree with you. The term coaching has become, yeah, it, it's it's an interesting one. I, I'm not even sure how to define that. And it's I don't, so, yeah. it's so, there are some great coaches out mm-hmm. there, like, and there are some really horrible ones, just like in any industry. But I feel like with social media, there's been a lot of play on coaching that is not warranted. So. And it's hard to vet someone who claims yes. they're a coach. It's usually based off their word. Um, one of the business coaches that I worked with, her name is Jessica Marks, and she's great. I um, I worked with her and I continue to work with her, you know, on and off. And she was different because she truly was invested mm-hmm. in my success. And I really felt that. Like, I, she, I could text her and let her know, like, what was a win, and she would celebrate with me, which I thought was really helpful. Um, And then I've been in other similar coaching efforts where I was like, their messaging and what they're offering is just not in align with my values and what I want for my business. And it was somewhat disappointing. So it's, Mm -hmm. you need to find someone who's going to celebrate your wins and then hopefully pick you back up when you have losses as well, a cheerleader per se. And also have a track record. I think that's Mm -hmm. one of the scarier things to me now. You see a lot of people that are pushing coaching programs and it's, they haven't proven that they're able to actually coach on that. So, yeah, interesting. So last question. We talked about this the last time, but six figures. You're you're almost to the seven-figure mark where I won't interview anymore, by the way. <laughs> no, I always tell people my, my demographic is six figures. Once you hit seven figures, I just don't think that – it's you speak about business in the same way. You're like at a different phase. Mm-hmm. So, um, but your last like words of wisdom from doing this over the last few years. What what am I not asking you? You know, I think a lot of people assume that starting a business is going to have an immediate return on investment, or they're going to magically make six figures in their first year, and that is not the case. You have to be prepared to not always have great years. You can make six figures one year and then, you know, hardly anything the next. Um, So understanding that it comes in waves and it doesn't mean that you didn't do the best that you could. It just means that there was a change in whatever the market was, the needs of the people that you were speaking with, maybe need to find a different client base. Mm -hmm. Um, But understand that it's not going to always be just a gravy train and you have to be prepared to accept the good with the bad. And if I'm looking at it from a perspective where you know, the IRS says that the first five years, most people will fail in business, um, that's absolutely possible. You just have to find a way to push through when things are not good and hopefully be innovative and find new ways to get you back to a, an area of your level of success. Mm-hmm. And business is, I think people think business, if you've never been in it, they, they're, oh, they yeah. think it's like this when it's really not. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you're definitely not going to work less hours. Yeah. Uh, I know a lot of people think that, oh, I went to my business myself so I could work less. I I try to work a certain number of hours per week, but I'm not going to lie that I'm not on my email on the car ride, like answering people, you mm-hmm. know, here and there. So understanding that it's not always going to be great and it's, it's hard, mm-hmm. um, but if you are always trying to find new ways to improve, that's where your customers and your clients are going to see that they want to work with you. Yeah, that was really well said. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for having me again. I appreciate it. It was great.